Nathaniel Green, the fighting Quaker. I call this a love story, a life lived for freedom. With a firm reliance upon the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Now, when these words were put into the Declaration of Independence on July the 4th, of 1776, Nathaniel Green was not a signer. He was already in the field hazarding his life, his fortune, and his sacred honor for your liberty and for mine. He was born on August the 7th, 1742. His father was a Quaker, and his sect of Quakerism didn't believe in a formal education. So that at the age of 13, Nathaniel Green could only read, write, and cipher. But on a winter's walk, he met a young collegian named Giles. And his discussion with this young man awoke in him a, life, a lifelong desire for learning. Uh, he also met, he began to make toys in his father's shop out of metal and sell them so he could buy books. He found a teacher in uh, Warwick where they lived who would teach him Latin and teach him geometry. In 1770, his neighbors elected him to the uh, General Assembly of Rhode Island and at the age of 31. And he began to spend time uh, at the governor's mansion who was his cousin, William Green. There, he met a young lady who was 15 years old named Catherine Littlefield. Catherine's mother had died when she was 10 years old and her father had sent her to live with her aunt, Catherine, after whom she was named, who was the wife of the governor. Caddy, as she was called, was in her element in this social hub of the day. She met and charmed all the great men and women of the colonies. Benjamin Franklin was a regular visitor there. She loved reading and music and dancing. She was immediately taken with a handsome and articulate young assemblyman. Nathaniel was shocked uh, in 1770 by the violence of the Boston Massacre. He then began to study law and he began to study war. And for a Quaker took an unusual step, he joined the Rhode Island Sons of Liberty. British tyranny became very personal to him in 1771 when his ship, the Fortune, was taken by the Gatsby, which was a custom ship of the British Army, British Navy. A year later, when the, when the Gatsby ran aground and was burned uh, off the coast of Warwick, he was a prime suspect in his burning. In 1773, because of his... Uh, participation in <clears throat> protests uh, in the Sons of Liberty, he was brought up in the Quaker Synod and was disowned for breaking its peace principle. Later that year, before Christmas, the Boston Tea Party took place, and the next spring in 1774, General Gage sailed into Boston with uh, 4,000 redcoats. He uh, shut down the uh, city. He shut down the port. He declared martial law. He uh, closed the Massachusetts Assembly and said, somebody's paying for this tea. Two months later, 32-year-old Nathaniel Green and 19-year-old Kay were married. The next, in April of the next year, the shot heard around the world at Lexington and Concord came to his attention there in Rhode Island, and he and three of his friends took up arms to go to help. But before they got to Massachusetts, they were told that the British had retreated back to Boston, and they were surrounded by 10,000 redcoats. So he returned to the assembly in Rhode Island, and he voted to raise 1,500 militia to arm and take uh, to help in Massachusetts. Then the question arose, who will be the general for this new group? Three men in the assembly were nominated. The joke was, the Baptist can't, the Methodist won't, but the Quaker can, and he will. So he marched as a brigadier general at the head of the 1,500 men to Massachusetts. The Second Continental Congress met on May the 10th of 1775. One of the first two things they did was to adopt the militias outside of Boston and uh, make them the new Continental Army, and send the most famous man in America, the hero of the French and Indian War, George Washington, to be their commander-in-chief. When he arrived on July the 3rd, 1775, he quickly noticed these two young self-taught generals, Henry Knox of Massachusetts and uh, Nathaniel Green of Rhode Island. 
He took these men under his wing, but not only did he take them under his wing, he also, the, Martha, who uh, had, had come to be with them, uh, also took their wives, Lucy Knox and Caddy Green, under her wings, and they were lifelong friends. These are some of the battles in which Nathaniel Green participated as he learned from General Washington and became his second in command. You'll notice here that uh, in, while they were still in siege outside Boston that their first baby was born and they named him George Washington Green. Their second baby was born a year later in 1777 and they named her Martha Washington because of their love for General and Martha Washington. Now of all of these things, the most important thing that happened was in the winter of 1777 and 1778 at Valley Forge, because Congress was trying to run the commissary and the quartermaster, 3,000 Americans died in camp from starvation and exposure and disease, mostly from smallpox. General Washington begged Congress, please let me choose a quartermaster. Let me put Nathaniel Green in charge. And they finally agreed. Now, Nathaniel didn't want the job. He said that uh, nobody in history has ever heard of the quartermaster. But if he had not fought in any battles... The job that he did as quartermaster for the American army would have had a large part in earning your freedom. Caddy realized right away that if she was ever going to have a home life or spend time with her husband, she was going to have to go where he was. So every winter, she and Martha Washington and Lucy Knox were with their husbands, and as often as she could when she was not having a baby, having to take care of her kids, even in the summertime, she would follow him into battles. Uh, you'll notice here that one of their babies she didn't even go home for, he was born, Nathaniel Jr. was born in 1780 while they were in winter quarters at Morristown. These are the battles that were fought uh, while he was in the three years that he was the quartermaster general. Finally, it looked like for Katie in 1780 that she was going to have a home life Benedict Arnold had uh, betrayed his country. He was no longer the commander at West Point. George Washington put him in charge at West Point, and she took her children there. But then in October, just a couple months later, was the terrible destruction of the Southern Army. Uh, I mean, in, in, excuse me, just in, a month later, uh, the disaster at Camden. Uh, Congress had been trying to pick the generals. They had uh, picked Howe down in Georgia. They had picked uh, Lincoln in South Carolina. They had both been defeated. They sent Horatio Gates down there, and he got nearly 6,000 of those uh, Americans killed. Only less than 1,000 of the Americans survived um, there at Camden, and he didn't stop running for 180 miles. George Washington uh, sent Nathaniel Green down there to salvage what was left of the army and to face the British most uh, dangerous and resourceful general. When he got there on December the 3rd, he sent a letter back to his friend Knox. He said, it's worse than I thought. My army is nothing but a dream. It is, it is only an army in imagination. We are a shadow. Everything that he had learned as a quartermaster, everything he had learned under General Washington now came, became vital to the survival of this army. They had to have food and clothing and weapons and there was no time to wait on Congress. So he obtained a loan on his Rhode Island estate, sure that Congress would reimburse him after the war. He immediately set out his engineers to survey all the Carolina rivers and ferry crossings and to record the locations of boats that he would need to ford all the rivers. He was brilliant at establishing supply lines and the allocation of transportation and distribution of scant resources. His army was vastly outnumbered, so he decided against all of the military books to divide his army, hoping that it would divide Corn Cornwallis' forces as well, and it worked beautifully. Cornwallis sent Bannister Tarleton out to face uh, General Morgan, and General Morgan had defeated Bannister Tarleton at Cowpens. His 1,200 men, of almost all of them, were killed or captured. 800 were captured. Bannister and a few others were able to escape on horseback. Morgan knew immediately that he needed to go and rejoin Green, and they needed to get out of there because Cornwallis, angry, would bring his full force. And here was what became known as the race to the dam. You can see here's Cowpens, just here in northern South Carolina. 
He and uh, Green met up here at Callens Ford, just north of Charlotte, and they crossed Callens Ford here on February the 1st, and, and Cornwallis was just hours behind. Nathaniel left snipers and army there to keep Cornwallis from crossing. When Cornwallis got to Cowan's Ford, it was almost night. And because of the snipers, because all the boats had been taken over to the other side, he decided to wait until the next morning in order to cross. But uh, his, a rain came up that night, and, and he was not able to cross for two days because he didn't have any boats. It was there that he decided he would burn all of his extra equipment, his extra wagons, and when Green heard that, knowing that Cornwallis had uh, burned his extra supplies, he says, we have him. And Green said, my plan is fight, get beat, rise, and fight again. And that's exactly what took place as they retreated back across North Carolina. It was on February the 3rd that they got across Trading Ford on the Yadkin River. And then... Uh, he sent a letter, a dispatch, up here to Virginia to Patrick Henry and said, you need to have 1,500 fresh troops ready at the Dan River when I cross because Cornwallis is going to be right on my heels. He sent 700 soldiers north to try to make Cornwallis think he was going to go try to go this part of the Dan, and then he took the rest of his men over to the Dan to the ferries here, and uh, on February the 13th and 14th, he took his armies across the Dan uh, in the middle of the winter. The last of the Americans uh, made it across the river in the middle of the night by torchlight. Uh, sure enough, the next day, um, exhausted and starving, Cornwallis arrived at the dam. It was swollen with rains and uncrossable without boats. And all the boats and the ferries were on the Virginia side. Cornwallis exclaimed, Green is as dangerous as Washington. I never feel secure when encamped in his neighborhood. He is vigilant enterprising, and full of resources. Dennis Conrad says, This American retreat, which extended across the breadth of North Carolina, is considered one of the masterful military achievements of all time. Henry Knox wrote to John Adams and said, With a weak force, he achieved victory, establishing his reputation from now on. For without means, without anything, he has performed wonders. A week later, bolstered by new troops, he moved back across the dam into North Carolina, and he got Cornwallis to engage him at Guilford Courthouse. He was so masterful in his plan that half of the British army had been surrounded and was about to be annihilated. Cornwallis, in desperation, ordered his artillery to just shoot right into the melee, and he killed as many of his own men as he did of Greens, but it, but it caused the men to separate and allowed the British troops to withdraw and regroup. But he lost 28% of his army. He was then ordered by Clinton to go to Yorktown and to uh, build a harbor there so that the British could bring in men and new supplies. But the French fleet arrived there on August the 20th and cut off the British plans to resupply Cornwallis. George Washington and Rochambeau came down from the west and they... they uh, trapped Cornwallis there in Yorktown. With Cornwallis bottled up in Yorktown, Nathaniel Green went down to finish wiping up the British in South Carolina and in Georgia, and then he helped those, those states uh, to rebuild their states and to rebuild their uh, uh, governments. The war didn't end until 1783. Ironically, General Greene's most daunting battles began once the war ended, and merchants began hounding him for payment and judgment against him, and they became coming down from Carolina courts. And unfortunately, no matter how strongly he lobbied Congress, Congress, operating under the Articles of Confederation, had no way to reimburse Nathaniel Greene or any of the founders who had committed all of their personal finances to the war effort. North Carolina and South Carolina and Georgia had all given Nathaniel Greene land uh, in their appreciation, land that had been abandoned by loyalists who'd fled to England, but even selling all the holdings that he had in the Carolinas didn't pay off his debt. So his Rhode Island estate, with which he had secured the money to feed and clothe and arm his men, was taken by the courts, just as his wife Catherine was given birth to their fifth baby 
uh, Louisa Catherine in 1784. Caddy was shaken to know that they were paupers, but even worse, it broke her heart to see how the debt weighed so heavily on the general. She wrote to a friend that the Nathaniel she now saw before her was a tired, haggard ex-soldier who had given himself to a belief, had signed away his future life, in fact, for that cause. In 1785, after losing his property in Rhode Island, Nathaniel moved his family to his remaining property in Mulberry Grove Plantation, Georgia, hoping to raise uh, rice there and work his way out of debt. Catherine left all her family and friends and took her little babies there and, and tried to help him to establish this plantation and to establish the family life that they had always dreamed of. Nathaniel's last letter to his old friend Henry Knox said, I work hard and I live poor, but I fear I will never be out of debt. On June the 18th, he was at a neighboring plantation looking at their rice operation walking through the fields in the heat and humidity of the day when he was stricken by a splitting headache. They rushed him home to Mulberry Grove where the next day he died in Caddy's arms from a heat stroke at the age of 43, leaving her a 30-year-old widow with five mouths to feed, ages 10 to 2, deeply in debt. It took Caddy years, but finally after the Articles of Confederation were replaced with the Constitution, the new government was able to honor her claims, and her old friend Alexander Hamilton wrote her a check with which she was able to finally pay off their debts in 1792. It was General Patton that said, it is foolish to mourn the deaths of such men. We should thank God they lived. Well, I thank you, God, for General Nathaniel Green and for his equally faithful and sacrificial wife, Caddy. It is with, from men and women like that that we have our freedom.